I'm Aaron Ross Powell, and this is Reimagining Liberty, a podcast exploring the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. We can argue at length about the proper role of government, but if we're to have any state at all, one of its clear jobs is to protect us from crime and to punish criminals. And yet the American criminal justice system is anything but just, and a full accounting of just how bad it is can be pretty harrowing. The criminal justice system is the most direct application of violence by government on its citizens, and it's overrun by corruption, self-interest, racism, and brutality. To talk about just how bad things are and how we can build a more humane system, I'm joined by journalist Radley Belko. For years, he's been the top writer in the country when it comes to investigating, exposing, and cataloging the horrors and corruption of the American criminal justice system. Radley and I talk about the state of our system the prospects for reform in the wake of the widespread protests after the murder of George Floyd, and why many in the liberty movement tend to turn into law and order, bust some heads conservatives whenever those pushing back on police violence and state injustice get even the slightest bit unruly. How bad is the American criminal justice system? Uh, wow, so that, that's a pretty open-ended question. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. I think we had a generation or so, generation and a half of just sort of relentless punitiveness coming out of both parties, you know, starting in probably the late 70s through uh, the mid 2000s. And for about 10 years there, I would say from 20, 2008, 2009 to the last maybe 2019, right before the pandemic, um, you know, I would say that there was a genuine kind of uh, consensus for reform, uh, both more so in the electorate because politicians tend to follow behind on those sorts of things. But, um, you know, but I, even over that 10 year period or so where there was a genuine appetite for reform, um, you know, it was accompanied by a historic drop in crime. And I think that's what made reform possible. And I, I remember just sort of all through those years thinking, you know, this is all great, you know, but I wonder, you know, if this is going to hold, if there's enough traction here for to withstand kind of the first increase in crime, major increase in crime. And sure enough, um, we've had our first major increase in crime or uptick in crime, in some cases surge in crime. Uh, and, you know, everybody's bailed for the most part, um, including, you know, a lot of our fellow libertarians. Yeah, that has been striking seeing how many people in the in the libertarian camp have over the last couple of years turned on say reform DAs bought into the our cities are rife with crime and it's because of calls to defund the police or calls to reform or general disrespect for authority or ignoring misdemeanors and so on and it's it's frustrating, yeah, how much it seems America's appetite for criminal justice reform is not based on the quality of our criminal justice system, but just kind of based on how much they're like what the vibe is at a given moment. I think, you know, I think if you look at like the way a lot of libertarians turned on uh, Chesa Boudin in San Francisco, um, so much of it was just animated by this kind of general antipathy for the left and the fact that he, you know, was socialist and that I guess he was like a translator in the Hugo Chavez administration many years ago. But, you know, obviously just a district attorney has no effect on economic policy or regulatory policy. Um, and, you know, libertarians over the years, we've had no problem sort of politically aligning ourselves with people on the right, even though we may have, you know, vehement disagreements with them on you know, criminal justice or cultural issues. Uh, so, you know, now you have these reformist DAs who, you know, should align with the libertarians on the issues where they actually have some power, but because they come from the left and, you know, associate with the left, um, there's just been this sort of real kind of antipathy for them among libertarians. Um, and I think that's really uh, unfortunate. Um, and, you know, I think part of it also is this, this, sort of caricaturization of um, the left in some libertarian quarters where, you know, I saw lots of libertarians accuse the Jesse Boudin administration of not prosecuting property crimes. And that just, just wasn't true. I mean, if you look at the statistics, um, 
his office did prosecute them. Um, there, you know, there was a movement in California to, or, or not a movement, a, a ballot measure that increased the amount of money you have to steal, or amount of property you have to steal uh, to be charged with a felony under shoplifting laws. But, but California is still, that, that threshold is still far below that of many other states, including some pretty red states uh, in the South. So, yeah, there was nothing, uh, you know, what happened in San Francisco, I think that you had a lot going on. You had the pandemic, you have San Francisco has always been kind of a bastion of homelessness. Um, there was a, you know, a, a reluctance to prosecute people for low-level drug crimes. Um, and that really kind of seems to be what fueled a lot of the anger. And because, you know, you had more open-air drug use and open-air drug markets, but like for, you know, libertarians of all people to kind of jump on that uh, as a reason to sort of uh, oppose him and support the uh, recall effort. It was just it was just really disappointing. And it felt kind of lazy, like lazy thinking among certain libertarian crowds, um, uh, that, you know, just kind of jumping on with the uh, crime is out of control, uh, law and order narrative that we've been railing against for the last 30 years. Yeah, I think that that conservative influence is strong. The I mean, I've kept written about this and talked about this of the the issue of so many coming to libertarianism from the right and so bringing that cultural affinity um and it does seem a lot of it does seem to manifest in just it's okay we should reduce the number of crimes on the books police need reform but also like the unruliness of the oppressed must be stamped out uh, and it, it makes me think I, I just I was going to read this really quick because I came across this just a few days ago. I was reading um, a book for a, another upcoming podcast, and it was a line from Bill Buckley in 1965 that seemed to resonate with this kind of attitude that I see a lot of. And so he was talking to the, um, I think it was New York police officers, and he was talking about a cop in Mississippi in 1965 who had been killed and a, and a civil rights activist who had also been killed. And he said that every age in which values are distorted, an age like our own, in which truths are thought either not to exist or to exist only as quaint curios from the dead past, the wrath of the unruly falls with special focus on symbols of authority, of continuity, of tradition. It is no accident that all the police – at all that the police should be despised in an age infatuated with revolution and ideology. And I think you could have seen that today and it, it was the – like the ignoring of the plight of the oppressed that – like it doesn't occur to him that the reason you might dislike police in Mississippi in 1965 isn't because you're infatuated with ideology but because the police are actually pretty bad in Mississippi in 1965. Um, and I think for a lot of a lot of people in our camps, it was this – it is like – it is okay to say the police are bad and oppressive, but the response to that is just like vote harder. But don't, don't get out on the streets. Don't be disruptive. Don't have any kind of marginal misbehavior on the edges of your protests. Um, and if any of that happens, we need to bust heads. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the classic – sort of uh, example that I always see thrown at libertarians and conservatives when they complain about, you know, destruction of property uh, as a matter of, as a means of protest is, you know, the Boston Tea Party, which of course we celebrate. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think on the right and, and increasingly in libertarian circles and particularly among the current incarnation of the libertarian party, there is just this absolute kind of revulsion at, at, letting black people express their frustration at ra of, about racism. Like, you know, Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem is somehow extremist, uh, you know, mentioning race in, in pop culture and TV and music is seen as sort of, you know, don't, don't let politics infect your life. You know, uh, don't, you know, like, like we shouldn't let politics control our consumer decisions, right. Um, or, or, you know, matters of race or racism. Uh, and then of course, protest itself is seen as, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know, it's, it's frowned upon, it's laughed at, it's kind of mocked and ridiculed. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's always kind of baffled me. And I, I guess I used to be part of this camp a little bit, the camp that kind of denied, 
racism or, or thought or argued that racism wasn't a big deal. Um, and then of course I started writing about these issues and you see, you know, the, the issue of structural racism, which I think is widely misunderstood uh, on the right and in libertarian circles as this like structural racism means everybody within a given system is racist. Uh, you know, you're accusing everyone of that. And of course it's, it's almost the opposite of that. It's that the intent of individuals in that system doesn't matter. You know, the system itself was constructed at an era when racism was, you know, part of our, it was sort of woven into the fabric of everyday life. And the idea that, you know, we can, that, that all of a sudden we can collectively decide that racism and, and Jim Crow are a bad thing, but still have these institutions that were developed and honed and evolved uh, during, you know, the 100 or so years when Jim Crow was kind of dominant, you know, in, in huge parts of the country. Like, I think it's just really naive. And, and you know, we, we um, to me, the idea, you know, the one libertarian to respond to you often hear uh, when you talk about racism is like, well, racism is collectivism. You know, like we, we, we think as individuals, we don't think as collectives. And, you know, I agree. I'm, I'm also an individualist. But when the government itself is treating people collectively, when it's punishing, you know, entire groups of people because just because they share some common characteristics with people who, you know, may commit crime at a higher rate or may... You know, you can assign whatever other collective wrongs you want to. I mean, that we should be opposed to that. We should be fighting that tooth and nail because it's the antithesis of, of individualism. And yet there's this sort of knee-jerk reaction, I think, in some quarters to just refuse to admit that racism is a problem. Um, and, and from people who it would cost nothing to admit that, you know, <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't hurt you at all to set, to admit that the criminal justice system is racist or the highway system is racist or, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the whole kind of banking mortgage system was built on racist foundations. I mean, it doesn't hurt any of us personally to admit that. So I, I've, I just be, I'm increasingly baffled at the reluctance to sort of acknowledge these kind of basic truths. I mean, I think part of it obviously is just if, if you've spent decades allying with the right and networking with the right, talking about race is uncomfortable for people on the right. And so just saying let's talk about other things allows you to preserve those relationships, even though I don't know that those relationships are often worth preserving. But there is a – I have heard from libertarians who reject kind of race talk, particularly in criminal justice, an argument that goes something like this, and I'm curious how you respond to it, which is – so let's take police brutality and police killing of – unarmed civilians or you know just general children of police violence is <clears throat> that in in the media and in a lot of just political discussions that gets framed as a race issue that police are killing unarmed black men and when it gets framed as a race issue then the focus of reform and just the overall like vector of solution is let's get the racism out of like get rid of racist cops, fix the racism, and then this isn't a problem. And the response, the, the argument goes like, no, like police are – and American police are like uniquely violent uh, and, and the violence is the problem. And that violence falls on unarmed black men, but it also falls on unarmed white men and lots of people. And if we focus on the race issue, then we're not – we're not fixing the underlying real problem, which is police violence. And so we should stop talking about the race and that also talking about the race alienates some people who might otherwise be allies on the underlying like real problem of how violent American cops are. Yeah. So, you know, a few responses to that, I guess. Uh, so on the second point, um, I think the evidence just doesn't bear that argument out. So, the George, after the George Floyd protests, we saw the most substantive, um, uh, really successful move, movement for police reform that I've seen since I've been covering these issues. Um, now, lots of people like to say, oh, well, you know, Congress, because of partisan bickering, they didn't pass the police reform bill. But that was at the federal level. I mean, criminal justice reform or criminal justice policy is overwhelmingly decided at the state and local level. And there, I mean, we have seen massive reforms across the country. We've, I mean, I, in... 20, 25 years now of covering, you know, SWAT issues, police militarizations, no knock raids. You know, five years ago, I never would have dreamed of the possibility that you would see 
even cities banning no knock raids, much less, you know, states and state legislatures. And we have seen that. And it's remarkable that like this is even an issue. Uh, the idea of qualified immunity, yeah, it, we have not repealed qualified immunity or, or changed it in any significant way. However, just the fact that we're talking about it, that politicians are talking about it, that last poll I saw over 60% of the public supported it um, is remarkable. I mean, it, there has been this incredible shift. And I think, you know, the timing uh, isn't coincidental. I mean, I think the, the George Floyd protests, um, the protests of 2020 really moved the needle on a lot of these issues. And, and those were about race. I mean, race is what motivated those protests. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you look at the the group Campaign Zero, the reforms that they've recommended um, for policing, you know, some of them are, you know, uh, efforts to get more diversity in police departments or make police departments look more like the communities they serve. And I think there's a, a, a logic behind that. There's some stuff about diversity training, but a lot of it are reforms that, you know, would make police brutality against everyone uh, less common, or at least there'd be more accountability. Um, so, you know, I think, I don't think there's any version of police reform where you take the racism out uh, and somehow they're just as brutal as they were before. It's just now they're more brutal against white people. Um, it just doesn't, I don't know. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, I guess my other response to that kind of line of argument is that, you know, <laughs> there is a, 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 you know, pretty radical reform movement uh, that gained a lot of traction during the George Floyd protest that is kind of universal. And that is, uh, um, you know, would affect policing in all of its forms against, you know, when the victims of when the victims of whatever race or, or creed, and that's the defund movement, right? I mean, defunding police uh, means that uh, police are, are not going to have the funding to brutalize anyone. Um, and, you know, you don't have to buy in fully with the idea that we need to completely defund police or be a police abolitionist to, like, appreciate some of the arguments that people in that movement have, have advanced. Uh, things like just overall shrinking the footprint of policing. Uh, really successful programs like uh, CAHOOTS, uh, which started in Eugene, Oregon, which sends uh, you know a social worker or a counselor uh, instead of police when people call 911 because somebody's having a mental health crisis or um, you know, is threatening suicide or even threatening other people. Um, those programs have had enormous success everywhere they've been tried. Things like fi fi uh, like funding violence interruption, uh, you know, in cities across the country. The, the research is still preliminary on that, but I would think it's libertarians if if there's promising early research that there's a method of controlling crime that involves negotiation and uh, de-escalation and not brute force and guns and batons. Yeah, I would think we would want to look into that, especially given that in the places where it does seem to have succeeded, it's actually cheaper than hiring more police officers. So, you know, I think there are, I think the answers to, to, to that line of argument, this idea that if we take race out of it, we'll, we'll have more success. One, I don't think it's been, been proven in the real world as we saw with the George Floyd protests, but also those, those solutions, um, the solutions that would affect everyone, are the very solutions that we see people on the right and 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 sort of right leaning libertarians read regularly sort of ridiculing and mocking this idea of oh well somebody you know somebody shot somebody so we're going to send a social worker instead of a cop uh, well you know what <laughs> sometimes I think a social worker is is has actually been proven more effective and is less likely to lead to violent outcomes. Yeah, I will admit to thinking it was funny in a kind of bizarre and sad way how many libertarians seem to oppose their we want to defund everything except the cops it's like that's that's going a bit that's going a bit too far uh, but yeah, it's it's like when have libertarians ever been against abolishing a government agency that we see as abusive because that's too extreme and radical i mean we i mean we know that the cia is never going to be abolished we know the irs is never going to be abolished but we call for it anyway because it it moves kind of the, the Overton window. It, you know, it's an opening bid, you know, in kind of the public debate. But suddenly when you suggest that about police, that's, you know, that's something to be mocked and ridiculed. Um, and I, you know, it's been pretty disappointing. And, I, and again, I think it goes back to, uh, you know, the libertarian kind of libertarian, libertarians who, who, who associate more or identify more with the right and the left. I think they put more of an emphasis on property rights and individual rights. And they see police as protecting yeah, you know, occasionally violating individual rights, but the, but far more often protecting property rights. But it does seem like there is a. 
I don't want to say that the only barriers to criminal justice reform or a more humane criminal justice system are coming from the right because we see you know, there's the carceral left as well. Like the this, you know, bad guys need to be – maybe this is just kind of an American culture thing. Like people we don't like need to be punished and they need to be punished harshly. And we need to – so throw the book at them and – and it comes up, you know, like, yeah, everyone is always just calling for more laws, more crimes. And and anytime anyone gets off or gets what looks like a light sentence, there's these calls for, like, this is unfair. We need, you know, these people over here, like, these oppressed people have gotten – this is a big one, I think, on the left – is these – a black man gets a high sentence. This other guy got a lower sentence. The solution is not to necessarily lower the sentences that the, the black men are getting, but to like ratchet up the sentence to further punish the, the groups we don't like. Yeah. And, and so a couple of responses to that one, I think um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is, there, there are carceral fractions to the left. I mean, I, I, some of the most kind of, angry visceral reactions I've gotten on Twitter over the last few years or one when I, uh, you know, said maybe it wasn't a good idea to charge the parents of the Michigan school shooter, um, you know, with, with murder or manslaughter, because that opens a, a door that I don't think we want to go down. And the people who are going to, you know, whatever you think about those parents, and, and I don't think they should be charged with manslaughter, maybe, you know, recklessness or negligence, but, um, you know, the people who are going to be victimized by that are not the people who you think, you know, the people who are in the high profile cases. And man, I just had people come down on from the left, you know, really hard on me for daring to suggest that this white couple in Michigan who, you know, had a lot of guns maybe shouldn't be prosecuted. Um, the other plate, I mean, there's, you, you sort of, um, I think alluded to, you know, there's the carceral feminism uh, uh, folks that, that, you know, want to take down protections for people accused of, you know, sex crimes. There's also the, the sex traffic, anti-sex trafficking people who, you know, really abuse statistics and data to call for more carceral policies. Um, and then the, the group that really just, uh, I mean, I, I, among the most kind of angry and, and unforgiving on Twitter are the anti-car people. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, a motorist, you know, strikes a bicyclist and kills a bicyclist or a pedestrian. And, you know, maybe the motorist was reckless and at fault. Maybe they were weren't, maybe they were, you know, some, somewhat at fault, but they're just, the calls for, you know, long sentences um, are just, uh, I remember the, um, there was a, a story a while back where a, I think it was an a immigrant truck driver was driving down a hill on an interstate and the, the brakes went out on the truck um, and he ended up killing, I, I don't know, several people. Um, and, you know, he got this really long sentence and there was a lot of outrage about it, but among the kind of the anti-car people, there was, you know, this defense of this really long sentence given to this guy for what was, you know, he, I think he made a couple of mistakes uh, that he, you know, while he was trying to figure out what to do once he realized his brakes were out. Uh, but the idea that, you know, he was looking at decades in prison. Uh, so I, I do think that there is, that's definitely, you know, there is a carceral left that, that um, I think, you know, needs to be challenged on a lot of these issues. Um, I will say, however, also, though, that there is this problem where sort of powerless people, people who don't have a platform, are, are subject to these kinds of everyday injustices and, you know, everyday slights. They're, they're treated really poorly in the criminal justice system. And then you have, you know, Trump's associates, uh, you know, who... You know, the police, maybe they, they arrest the, like, serve a warrant on Manafort or, or um, Roger Stone, you know, in a not the most polite manner. You know, they knock on the door, but they come in with guns and they, they handcuff them. And, and you know, they're, first of all, those, those cases always, you know, tend to be exaggerated. They, they, you know, they were called, you know, 3 a.m. no knock rage when actually they were, you know, 7 a.m. rage when the police did knock first. You know, and even that, you know, I think is excessive and unnecessary and frog marches are, de are dehumanizing. Um, but that isn't the, vast, the way the vast majority of people, you know, get ra raided in these cases or people who are suspected of, you know, low level drug crimes. You know, they get their doors kicked down in the middle of the night. They get flashbang grenades detonated. Um, you know, they, they get abused. Uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, the, those types of tactics are a way of punishing people before they're even charged, uh, much, much less convicted. And I do think that when sort of, 
people with power and people who have a lot of influence among other people in power are treated in a way different than everyday people are treated in the system, there's less urgency for reform, right? There's the, the, they, the system that, you know, I see or that you see or that anybody we know who might get arrested or pulled over sees is a very different justice system than what everyday people see. And I think if more of us saw the real justice system in action, we would be more likely to support reform. You know, I'm not saying treat everybody equally bad. I am saying though, I, I do understand the argument that when, when a certain classes of people get a different kind of justice, they're not going to, you know, be as, they're not going to be on board for reform because they're not seeing what happens to the most vast majority of people. Is it that they're not seeing it? I mean, I think this, I think you're right. Like, absolutely. If more people like us saw the criminal justice system in action um, at, you know, at the, among the the underprivileged people, it would change some minds. But it also seems like there's this strain in American culture, American thinking that is, you know, maybe it's a it's like a corrupted version of meritocracy or something that that people who are on the bottom somehow like behaviorally deserved it or led to their own, you know, they they caused those problems. And so the the harsher treatment of them is if not deserved, at least necessary, because you know we're us us wealthier, educated people don't really need to be pushed around or have our huds busted because we've shown that we can behave ourselves. But the poor, you know, they're they're poor because they couldn't behave themselves, and so they need that harsher treatment. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely something to that. Um, I you know, but <laughs> the thing is, if you if you ask those people to actually think about it, you know, I, I've seen arguments. There was a case in Minneapolis recently where a guy was killed because he was staying with his brother who was wanted in a murder and the police came in and, you know, kicked down the door and he was on the couch and they shot and killed him. Um, and, you know, the, the argument I saw was, well, you know, why are you associating with somebody who, you know, is a sus suspect in a murder and, you know, maybe not murder, but, you know, <laughs> this idea of like, any, you know, we saw this in the Breonna Taylor case. Well, she shouldn't have been associating with people who are involved in illegal drugs, you know. And, you know, I had, even before the, the reform, drug reform movement, you know, I, I wasn't a big drug user. I never sold drugs, but I had a lot of friends who, you know, smoked pot, bought pot, sold pot. Um, it's just that they were, you know, frat guys at, at, you know, the college I went to, or they were, you know, people in the, nonprofit movement in DC, you know, it's like they were white people who sold drugs to other white people. And somehow like when we think about like, well, if you don't want to be on the receiving end of the criminal justice system, you shouldn't hang out or associate with people who commit crimes. Well, you know what? We all associate and hang out with people who commit crimes. It's just that, you know, the people that you and I associate with who commit crimes are less likely to be arrested for them than, than other people. Um, but yeah, I, I, one thing I would just really recommend people do, just go to your local courtroom, the, the court where people are arraigned on, on charge and just sit there for a day for, or for three or three or four hours. I, I did this uh, right before the pandemic because I was going to write a book on criminal defense, which kind of got put on hold because of the pandemic. But, you know, I've been at the time I've been covering this stuff for 15, 20 years and just sitting in a courtroom, I learned so much and I learned the system is so much more brutal and dehumanizing and just you know, just crushingly punitive than even I, you know, my cynical self had, had assumed, uh, from covering this stuff for so long. Uh, and, you know, I'll just give you one quick example. I sat in a courtroom in Kentucky in rural Kentucky, um, you know, very white County and poor County. And I was sitting there in a case and I started talking to this guy next to me who, uh, was in court because, uh, well, it's a court because of a, of a charge in Kentucky called constructive possession. And I'd heard about this in cases where the police pull over a carload of people and they find some, you know, pot or cocaine or heroin, whatever in the car. If nobody claims it, then the police claim, say, you know, under this theory of law, they can charge everybody in the car for possession of the drugs that they found. Um, and it's a way of, you know, turning people against one another and, and threatening them with prison time. But in this case, this guy was visiting, uh, his, his, I think it was his brother and the police raided the house while they were there and they found some, I think it was some, uh, uh, meth in the house. And, you know, he told me the meth belonged to his brother, but he also didn't want to give his brother up. 
And so he and his wife and their like teenage kid and then his brother and his wife and then two neighbors who were over are all charged with constructive possession. And, you know, they all kind of don't they, they knew the brother had a drug problem. You know, they knew that if he got caught again, he's probably going to go to prison for a long time. And so nobody wanted to give him up. But so now they're all facing these charges. I mean, this guy was a, literally he was a grave digger and was worried that he was going to lose his job because this is a, you know, the third time in a couple of months he had to come to court and he kept getting continuances and delayed. And, you know, it's just like that one raid just, you know, disrupted so many lives. Um, and, you know, you could say, well, don't have a brother who does meth. You know, and uh, okay, you know, I mean, you know, don't don't support your brother if he has a drug habit or don't, you know, don't go over to his house if you think they're, I mean, you know, I, I don't think any of us in our own daily lives would, would, you know, sort of require ourselves to abide by rules like that. But when we're talking about sort of, you know, lower income people who we think, as you said, you know, we already suspect have some sort of character flaws or they won't be low, wouldn't be low income in the first place. Um, we hold them to a much higher standard. One of the barriers that there seems to be to genuine reform in, in the criminal justice system, whether that's in policing or prosecutions, um, is the way that the press reports on this stuff, um, the the way that they – you know, I mean we talk about like – Local news broadcasts get called out for this all the time of they just are like stenographers for the local police department and just repeat, you know, whatever kind of nonsense um, the the cops have told them about the situation. But even even like large outlets seem to be either very credulous about what law enforcement agents tell them in a way that they don't seem to be with other agents of the state. You know, they're more skeptical of what military leaders might say or what bureaucrats might say or what members of Congress might say than what law enforcement does. Um, or, and this I think was the case very much with this this wave of reform DAs that we got, is that they almost seem to be like in the tank for anti-reform forces in, in the sense of they'll just jump on anything as an example of like, see, this isn't working. We'll report on these crime waves ravaging our cities and so on. Like what is going on there? Because particularly like the mainstream larger press is not, it's not like these are bastions of right wing thought in, in the way that we typically think of it. Like, you know, the New York times is not filled with a bunch of Republicans. Um, and yet it seems to be, fairly right reactionary when it comes to a lot of criminal justice matters. And that seems to play out in a lot of places. Like why is the press, I guess that way? Um, I think there, there is a, um, there's certainly, you know, I think conservatives are right that, that the media mainstream media certainly leans left or, or is, is fairly far to the left of the, of the mainstream uh, of the population. But there is I think an even more powerful bias for uh, institutions for sort of um, uh, what's a good word um, for, I mean, the libertarian in me wants you to say power, but I think there's, there's a, a an in, there's a bias toward government power and toward government having more power. Um, and this idea that if we just sort of have the right, you know, people in charge who are the right experts and have the right, you know, education and training that, you know, just giving them a lot of power, we'll, we'll get what we want. We'll get, a, you know, we'll get the society we want. Um, the example I often give is, you know, when, when Colorado was, when the ballot initiative to legalize marijuana uh, was being sort of debated, um, I can't remember the exact numbers. I used to give the numbers in a speech, but I, I want to say maybe like of the 50 largest papers in the country that editorialized legalization, I think it was like 48 or 49 of them were opposed. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not a left-wing bias. That's a bias sort of against individualism and a bias toward, uh, you know, kind of planning, central planning, uh, top-down kind of manage, you know, this idea that we should kind of entrust uh, our, the people can't sort of be, be trusted to make their own decisions, that they have to have sort of smarter, more educated people sort of dictate what their decisions ought to be. Uh, and I think there is that, that kind of bias. And I don't think it's, I don't think that's a, a, um, at root, I don't think that's a, a left or a right bias. Cause I, I mean, I think you do see that kind of 
deference to authority on the right in certain areas and you see it on the left in certain areas. Um, but I think in the media, you see it sort of across a broad range of policy. I think it's also easy sometimes to forget how quickly like the culture has changed on some of these things like drug legalization. There's every now and then this clip will pop up on Twitter of it was in the 90s. It was Ron Paul on the Morton Downey Jr. show. And and it must have been mid 90s, I think. And he's he is talking about marijuana legalization. And he's just like, we should, you know, Ron Paul's doing his Ron Paul thing of we should legalize marijuana. And Morton Downey Jr. just lays into him as like, this is the stupidest, you know, most nonsense idea I can possibly imagine. Um, and the audience is like booing, the entire audience is booing Ron Paul. And this was, you know, this was happening like while I was in high school, you know, and and like that that shift, like how much how much, I mean, the culture has changed a lot, but it wasn't too long ago that even things like as kind of prosaic as marijuana legalization were considered just unbelievably fringe and stupid. Uh, my favorite genre of those those types of clips is, uh, I want to say it was Donahue, but I'm not 100% sure, but it was Milton Friedman arguing for drug legalization with somebody like Donahue, somebody, you know, a, a prominent media figure associated with the left. And, you know, I'm pretty sure it was Donnie. It was just like absolutely mortified at the idea that, you know, that we should legalize. I think he was calling for legalizing all drugs. Um, and it was just seen as, you know, beyond the pale. And it, and also he was, you know, genuinely confused because of course, Friedman was thought to be sort of right wing and, and, you know, this, they were absolutely flummoxed at why this right wing economist would be for drug legalization. But yeah, I mean, those are, and I think, you know, it is easy to lose sight of, how far we've come. I mean, that, that on that issue in particular, it's just, you know, remarkable how many states have now legalized recreational pot. I mean, when I was researching my first book, I mean, when you go back and look at the rhetoric from politicians and the media in the eighties and nineties, you know, I mean, it was just, I mean, you get Republicans literally talking about sending drug, not even dealers, drug users to, you know, remote Pacific islands, you know, basically banishing them. Um, there was, you know, so there was no policy. I mean, one, one said that, you know, we need to be prosecuting anybody who takes money from a drug dealer. I want to, you know, I want to prosecute their dry cleaners, their lawyers, their bankers, you know? Um, so we've come a long, long way on that. At the same, you know, by the same token, and we have several states that have legalized marijuana. And we have several states that, you know, are still sending heavily armed SWAT teams into people's homes in the middle of the night over marijuana. Um, so, you know, we've come a long way, but in some ways we, you know, we're, we're kind of right back where we were. So then what are the paths forward for reform, uh, particularly now? Because as you said, like during the George Floyd protests and in the, the immediate aftermath of that, there felt like there was this moment and we did get reform DAs elected and we had a lot of talk about qualified immunity and then the Supreme Court kind of shut that down to some extent. But but it does feel like the tide has turned against that. Um, and people are, whether it was a false narrative created about the rise of crime or whether there was a you know an uptick in property crime and whatnot, and whether that was related to the reform DAs is an open question versus just the pandemic and so on. Um, but the the appetite seems to be drying up because people are, you know, concerned the world's a more dangerous place. And so how do we what are the most immediate avenues for improving things? I mean, I'm a, you know, I, I think, you know, I think my view is a little bit skewed and maybe, maybe yours is too. I don't want to be presumptuous, but by the fact that we, you know, I have seen libertarians who I, who I long thought were allies on the, these issues stray and, you know, kind of start adopting the Manhattan Institute rhetoric. And, you know, I found that, I, I found that profoundly disappointing. Um, but I'm not sure that that overall um, the appetite reform has completely dried up. I mean, you look at Philadelphia, which um, you know elected a a, a extremely uh, reformist DA, and you know experienced the same uh, surge in violent crime or at least murders that we've seen in similar sized cities across the country. And yet, he was overwhelmingly reelected, and in fact, uh, his margins actually grew in the areas that had seen the most gun crime. Um, so, you know, I think there is a, among the communities that are actually affected by these policies, I think there is, you know, acknowledgement and recognition that these policies aren't 
what's driving the crime rate. And a lot of what's driving the crime rate in these cities, I think, and obviously this is speculation and there's way too many variables to say anything for certain, but you know, part of it is mistrust in marginalized communities of the police makes it harder for police to fight crimes in those communities. And there are some studies showing that after a high profile police uh, shooting or beating um, calls to 911 from low income communities drop. Um, and, you know, I think that the George Floyd protest, I think, you know, I disagree with a lot of a lot of the reasoning uh, people use to argue that the protests are responsible for the increase in violence. But I do think there is one aspect of that that's true, which is that I think these protests do remind marginalized communities of their mistrust for the police, or maybe they, they, they sort of sow more mistrust. I think there's a lot of justification for it. Um, but I do think that it, it probably makes people less willing to cooperate with the police because, you know, their own kind of uh, uh, hesit hesit hesitancy and re um, reticence toward co cooperating with police gets reinforced when they see, you know, all these other people out there registering the same concerns. Um, so I do think there's there's something to that. I think, you know, I, I, I think it's probably justified. I also think a lot of these communities don't trust police because the one thing the police are supposed to do, which is you know, prevent or solve crimes, uh, prevent crimes, they don't do. Um, you know, they don't respond when people in these communities call 911. They don't respond in a, a timely manner. And, you know, they in most cities, police, you know, the homicide clearance rate is well under 50%. And in minority community uh, neighborhoods, especially, it's even lower. It's sometimes 20 or even 30, 30 or even 20%. So, um, you know, I think there is a lot of uh, mistrust in these communities. I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit here. Uh, let me get back to your point, though. Um, you know, what what can we, where can we go from here? I, I do think there's still an appetite for reform. Um, you know, I, I, in places like Boston, which has a, a, a extremely reform progressive, I guess you could say, prosecutor. Uh, Boston's been one of the few cities where crime has gone down over the last couple of years. Um, we've seen. Uh, progressive DAs be reelected in in uh, St. Louis um, uh, or other cities that aren't coming to me right now. But really, I mean, Boudin was was a symbolic blow to kind of the movement toward more progressive prosecutors. Um, but I don't think it's indicative of a larger trend right now. Um, so you know, I think we keep moving forward on the issues where there's popular support. I think qualified immunity, you know, would go a long way toward. Uh, curbing police misconduct. Um, it wouldn't actually, I think, prevent, I don't think it would have much effect on as a deterrent to individual officers, but what it would do is, because most of them are indemnified, <clears throat> but it would, what it would do is force these cities uh, to make stronger police misconduct policies, to make police more accountable, to have better oversight, because every time they lose one of these lawsuits, they have to pay out a lot of money. And at some point, you know, they either run out of money or their municipal insurers are going to say, you need to make some changes or, or we're not going to insure you anymore. Um, and we have seen that in, in some smaller and mid-sized cities over the last few years. Um, so, you know, I think issues where there's broad public support, you can continue to move forward. I think qualified immunity, ending no-knock raids, more accountability for police. Uh, you know, one really popular issue on both the left and the right is diminishing the power of police unions. Um, you know, I think we need badly need reform there because the police unions, you know, what, what ends up happening is you have a, you know, a city that has a pension is in the midst of a pension crisis, which is pretty much every city in the country. And so when these public service uh, contracts come up for renewal, you know, the cities can't offer more pay. They can't offer more benefits or more compensation in other ways. So what they do is they offer less accountability, right? And more job security, uh, even for bad actors. Uh, and so I think, you know, diminishing the ability of police unions to, to negotiate, um, you know, one way to do it might be to open, you know, to not give exclusive negotiating rights to the dominant police union, the Fraternal Order of Police or whatever, whoever it is, and let, for example, the black police unions uh, negotiate, you know, negotiate on their own as well and that create some competition between them. Um, you know, I think that's an idea that might have a lot of, of, of sort of cross ideological ideological political support um so yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not you know i'm i'm a little demoralized at uh the loss of, of people that i long considered allies on these issues but i i don't think that you know i think there is still broad support broad public support for uh reform right now um 
And you know, part of it is also just not seeding the issue. I mean, I, you know, I, I think we have to point out that um, you know the, this increase in crime coincided with a once in a century sort of social upheaval that we, you know, I mean, no nobody in my lifetime or my parents' lifetime has ever seen before. So I, I don't think we need to seed all the ground either. Just because crime is going up doesn't necessarily mean we have to be defensive. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. Here's a preview of the next episode where I talk with Akiva Malament about equality and the nature of power. I think it's actually quite rare to find a left thinker who only cares about distribution of stuff. They also often care significantly about the way that human beings relate to one another. And I would say also it's not like people like libertarians or liberals only care about relational equality or you know equal rights or equality before the law because we also care about stuff right why do we talk about economic growth so much we talk about growth a lot because it levels the playing field of people's ability to do things with their lives about being able to make the choices they want to make about how their lives become easier because of innovation and so on right that is an equality of people's positive freedom of people's ability to make the kind of choices they want to make that liberals and libertarians actually care a lot about. And it's, I think, one of the primary motivating arguments for markets is that that's exactly what they allow people to do, is to give people more control over their lives and for more people to have more access and more stuff distributed more evenly than in non-market society. If you'd like to listen to my conversation with Akiva two weeks early, as well as get access to our Discord community, where you can discuss episodes with me and fellow listeners and participate in our fun new book club, just click the link in the show notes to learn more or head to reimagininglibertycom slash subscribe.